Well, as the videos were so popular uh, about what video games and films get wrong about gas masks or respirators, I thought I'd do one about radiation, because it's sort of a similar subject and it might interest a load of people. So I've got a good old Victorine um, model, it's a 6B isn't it here? Yep, yeah, it's old CDV 700 series. Um, and I can use that to demonstrate some points in the video a bit later on. But obviously Geiger counters are one of the most famous things to do with radiation, even though they're not the only radiation measuring device. Um, but that would be a good way of sort of starting this video, I think. So, obviously, Geiger counters are one of the devices used to measure radiation. However, in a lot of films or games, you always get a Geiger counter sound ticking, even if, you know, whatever they're meant to be using to measure radiation isn't a Geiger counter or similar. So, for example, if you had a little decimeter pen, that won't make a Geiger counter ticking noise. You know, most iron chamber units don't make a Geiger counter ticking noise. There are some that do, because manufacturers specifically made them make a ticking noise because that was a feature people wanted in them. But typically an iron chamber, you know, device won't do that. Some models of scintillators, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, do have a beeping or a clicking noise. But again, that will depend from model to model. But with ticking, it's only ever really to do with Geiger counters. The reason Geiger counters tick is that's each time it measures a count of radiation. Um, which will bring us on to another topic that lots of things get wrong. So, as you can see here on the display, hopefully, there we go, this has both a display of milliroentgen per hour and counts per minute. Now, rontgens are a measure of radiation, uh, of ionising radiation, and also, so are sieverts, so are greys, there's quite a few different units of radiation. Um, I'm not going to, in this video, talk about which I prefer, you know, over others and which is a better measurement. The point is that what a Geiger counter actually does is it counts. So the bottom display, which you can see, actually shows counts per minute. And how they do these is each Geiger counter is meant to be calibrated to a certain type of radioactive check source. So as in, if you know your quantity of radioactive source, how a Geiger counter is set up, you have basically, let's say they want to do it with cesium-137. They might have a curie or a micro curie of cesium-137 and they'd know in the lab exactly how much radioactivity that would give off. So the Geiger counter is calibrated for that. So basically what you do is the Geiger counter would be ticking at a certain distance from it because it's counting it. And then you would adjust the calibration on the Geiger counter so that would be your like dose essentially. Now on this display obviously because it's where it's got a label with each thing over it. I'm pretty sure th it says in the manuals to these that the check sources were um, they were calibrated on radium. So I assume it would be radium 226 but there's other radium elements. But the point is that each Geiger counter essentially to be accurate if it has an equivalent dose on it. Um, has to be calibrated to something. So it means for things it's not calibrated on, although the counts per minute will be accurate for that model of Geiger counter, it won't necessarily be the accurate dose of radiation you'd be receiving. So um, whenever you see in a film or something a Geiger counter ticking at a certain speed and they go, oh, that's, we know we're we'll experiencing this much radiation, that's not necessarily true. Um, and units of radiation are certainly one of the things that they get wrong in a lot of things. The only thing I think I've watched recently where radiation measurements were given at all accurately was Chernobyl, as in the TV series, the HBO one. Um, because the Soviet Unions were still using Rontgens as a measurement of radiation at that time, and the measurements of Rontgens they were giving was correct in terms of 3.6 Rontgen for what the low-level decimeters would say is a top-level thing. Decimeters are a point I'll come on to in a moment, versus Geiger counter and all that other stuff. And um, the problem is you get in a lot of things, though, compared to Chernobyl. Because, um, you know, in Chernobyl they were saying that, you know, it's the real numbers were like 10,000 wrong and 15,000 wrong and which was actually accurate. Uh, the problem you get in a lot of things, and the Fallout games are very, very, um, you know, susceptible to this, and I like the Fallout games, don't get me wrong, I want to just stress this again here. This is a nitpicky video, but it's a fun nitpicky video. Don't get to, oh my god, you said something bad about Fallout, can't you tell it's meant to be, like, comedic and stuff like that? But anyway, in Fallout, um, RADS is the measurement of radiation in Fallout games. Um, you die instantly if you get a thousand RADS. Um, I think it's every 200 RADS in the Fallout games you get like another negative effect from radiation sickness. So RADS, I've heard it's put as two different ways, either radiation absorbed dose or Rontgen absorbed dose. I always thought it was Rontgen absorbed dose, but as I've seen it as a two it could be either. But basically each one means the same thing. It's the amount of radiation deposited into the human body, not actually, you know, uh, radiation in the air or however a certain source is giving off per hour. So, an important thing to note about 
things like rads in the Fallout games, is when you're ex being exposed to radiation in something like Fallout, let's say Fallout 3, and I suppose this is mostly because of Bethesda this happened, it's not so much of a problem in the old Fallout games. Um, say Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4. Um, basically, if it says like 5 rads a second, um, what you have to bear in mind is that a rad and a rontgen are a pretty similar number. So if it was 5 rads a second, you'd have to times that by 60 to work out what the rontgens would be per minute. And then you'd have to times that by another 60 to work out the rontgens per hour. Now if we look at the worst nuclear catastrophes in human history, um, so if we use Chernobyl as a pretty good example, you know, the most contaminated areas of Chernobyl were so uh, supposedly, you know, like the elephant's foot and things like that, or sections of the roof, were supposedly about 3 to 5 rontgens per second. Um, or three to five ronkens per minute, potentially, you know, the slightly less contaminated area, but still severely contaminated, and that's a very high dose of radiation. Being somewhere for, like, fallout, just minor nuclear bits of waste, or bomb craters are giving off several, you know, rads per second, and that's completely impossible. Um, and that brings us very well onto another, um, you know, good point of um, radioactive decay. So, basically, everything that's radioactive has decay and half-lives, so... When a half-life, the simple way of putting a radioactive half-life, let's say we take radium-226, because I can remember this one, it has a half-life of 1,600 years. So in 1,600 years, it's about 50% as strong as it was, you know, back 1,600 years previously. Go 1,600 years again, it's 50% again. So how it works is it doesn't mean it's all gone at that point. It means if you had, let's say, radium giving off 10 ronken per hour, just as an example, in... 1,600 years, it would be 50 ronken per hour, or did I say 10 or 100, I can't remember. But the point is, like, so let's say start with 10 ronken per hour, 1,600 years later it would be 5 ronken per hour, 1,600 years after that it would be 2.5 ronken per hour, you know, then 1.25, so on, so on. Um, of course, it's going to depend on the type of nuclear um, material, lots of things that um, are made from nuclear bombs, so what you'd have is stuff that are called um, radionuclides, so stuff like strontium-90, cesium-137, cobalt-60, americinium-241, all of those guys. Um, the problem, iodine-131 is another important one as well. Um, the thing is with those, is the half-life of those is relatively short. I think cobalt-60 is about five years, things like strontium-90 and cesium-137 are about 30 years, roughly. So, in 30 years it would be at half its strength, in another 30 years it would be a quarter of its original strength, you know, or half the strength it was the last period. Um, so when you have lots of things like the Fallout games, or films set hundreds of years after a nuclear war, and stuff is horribly radioactive, it wouldn't be anymore. Um, I mean, I know if it's a fictional thing and they had their own kinds of weird nuclear bombs, that could be a thing, but in reality, you know, you can apparently go to the Trinity test site today when they open it every now and then, um, and it's barely radioactive there today. You can measure it as high in background, but it's not dangerously radioactive, and that was a former bomb site in the 1940s, you know, 1945 bomb test site. So if you think, you know, things that are set hundreds of years after a nuclear war, they wouldn't be that dangerous. Also, irradiation. This is a very interesting thing that lots of films and games get wrong. So, basically, in real life, if you're exposed to radiation, you might get radiation sickness, you know, you might get cancers later on in your life, but you don't yourself become radioactive. Now, if you got radioactive dust or contamination on your body, or inhaled it and stuff like that, you would be radioactive for a while, and if you were washed down, you wouldn't be radioactive anymore, and you know, if you coughed up all the dust. So, I suppose potentially, if you inhaled cobalt-60 or cesium-137 or ingested it, you could potentially be emitting radiation for a while, but not for very long. Um, the problem in lots of things is <clears throat> stuff becomes magically irradiated in like lots of films and games. Um, only in real life, it's only if you wipe it down. If you're exposed to neutrons, things can become radioactive, but the majority of the time, whenever there's radioactive contamination of something, um, neutrons are not involved. It's where the actual radioactive products have landed on something and that thing is contaminated because they are sitting on top of it. So, you know, if you wash them down or whatever, it, you know, it wouldn't be a problem. So if you had, like, cans of food in, like, these post-apocalyptic movies set hundreds of years after a nuclear war, the food wouldn't be radioactive. Unless it was actually so close that it was in a neutron bomb's explosion range or, you know, whatever like that, but in reality there'd be nothing left in that case. So when it's meant to be downwind of fallout, 
well, if somebody opened the can and ate the food inside, the food inside wouldn't be radioactive because, um, you know, the food hasn't been actually exposed to neutrons and become radioactive that way. Another thing I'd like to point out is in things where, this goes back to Fallout as well, where people eat stuff like, um, you know, like radioactive food and it makes them sick. Um, if you ate something that's irradiated, it does far more damage to you than if it's radiation outside the body. So one Rontgen per hour sort of exposure externally is much better than one Rontgen per hour exposure internally because you generally get alpha, beta or beta or gamma radiation. X-rays like weaker uh, gamma rays or, you know, gamma made outside from nuclear stuff. It's There's different things for that, but anyway, that's not the point of this video. Anyway, just think of alpha, beta and gamma. So with those three, alpha is essentially the biggest of the three, but it has the least penetrative ability. So if you get something that's an alpha source inside you, it does a lot of damage because it can't, essentially all that energy coming from it is being absorbed by your body. Uh, same thing with beta because it's not normally traveling far enough to get out of your body. If you ate something and it's gamma, it's actually the least damaging because some of that energy is leaving you. Actually, a lot of that energy is leaving you. But it's the same reason that why gamma energy is actually the most dangerous in some senses that from shielding yourself from it. Brings us on to shielding, lead. Um, if you actually look up, and this is an interesting thing, Google it, Google image it now, radiation lead shielding, you'll find actual pictures from medical stuff with lead shielding. Notice how thick the blocks are, they're like that. The reason is that when you actually have real lead shielding in real life, you need a lot of it. A little thin layer of roofing lead does not actually protect you from radiation. Uh, gamma rays, it might protect you a bit from beta radiation, um, but in terms of gamma, um, if you've got a strong gamma source, it's going to go through that lead like no problem. Um, distance is actually a much safer protective means. So, yeah, if, if you see things like where people are wearing just a little bit of lead on them, they might believe themselves it's helping them. In reality, it's probably not if it's a strong source of radiation. Um, against low strength x-rays, yes, uh, lead aprons would work fine and things like that. But against, um, you know, like doomsday tier amounts of gamma radiation, lead shielding does nothing that a person could wear because it's not thick enough. Look at what they put around, like, medical bits of cesium-137 and cobalt-60 using radiotherapy. Um, you know, it, it's like essentially almost like if you had the size of a car, the check source would be, or the source would be inside the car in the middle, everything else would be lead. That's just, you know, it'd be like having a garden shed and, you know, only the very centre of the shed is the source, everything else is the lead that is needed to keep it contained. So, yeah, lead doesn't work that effectively. It's a lot more effective than certain materials, but that's only because it's so dense. And that brings us on, I guess, to the last point I was going to make, which is something that, again, this is more in, like, really sci-fi um, comic book type things, but in real life, radiation does not cause cool mutations that give people superpowers or anything like that. It gives you cancers and, um, you know, horrible ways of dying, like acute radiation syndrome, if you get enough of it in a short period. So what it actually does to your cells is rather than giving you, like, super abilities, um, it just destroys them. It mutates them and essentially does similar things to cancers where your cell has been damaged, it no longer co is compatible with your body properly, and it causes your body to either fall apart slowly or quickly, depending on, you know, if it's a cancer that slowly spreads through your body or um, your body falls apart because it can't repair itself when it comes to, you know, do everything on a cellular regrowth level, which is essentially what acute radiation syndrome is. So, this video has probably gone on long enough. I hope you found it interesting. But the point is, in this video, that, um, yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of things that films get wrong about radiation. Um, hope this is just a few of the things. I could probably do another video about this later on, or about nuclear war in films. Um, that doesn't mean I don't enjoy some films and games, you know, about this stuff, but just bear in mind, it's probably not a good idea to say, I saw something in Fallout, or, you know, I saw something in, you know, something to do with radiation and superheroes, therefore I'm going to now talk accurately about radiation online. Um, oh, another thing I want to quickly shout out about Geiger counters while I was here, um, what I was saying about the calibration source and that, um, that's a fault with any Geiger counter in a sense, fault, um, that shows you an equivalent dose. The only accurate way a Geiger counter will measure, um, or truthful way, is counts per minute or counts per second. Because that's the Geiger counter literally telling you, this is exactly what I'm reading. Any Geiger counter that has an, um, an equivalent dose on the display is doing it based on what it's been calibrated on. So don't complain that a random Geiger counter 
doesn't um, show a correct dose on a random thing because unless it was what it was calibrated for and it's dreadfully wrong, uh, it's not relevant. So when I've seen people whinging online that they've got a therapy and it doesn't give an accurate idea of what the dose is on just radium, not radium, sorry, uranium pitch blend, um, rocks because it was calibrated on cesium-137, yes, that would be why, because it's been calibrated on something far more harmful, so it gives you a higher reading. Um, you know, what would you rather have if you had one that showed you an equivalent dose? One that gives you a higher reading, so you're unnecessarily cautious around something, or one that tells you everything is fine and then you horribly irradiate yourself on something. I know which I prefer, the one that actually warns me more than it needs to. But there you go. Geiger counters, all Geiger counters, if they have an equivalent dose on the display of it, whether it be digital or analogue, um, that is completely based on what they were calibrated on. That is not a fault of the Geiger counter if you don't know what that source was and then you blame it for different readings.